Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Malo Hudson. I'm the Dean of the School of Architecture here at UVA. And I am delighted to introduce Michael Mendez today because it's not every day that you get to introduce your former student who's done so well. So uh, we go way back. But uh, we're all here for the Dean's Forum on Inclusion and Equity Lecture. Michael Mendez is going to speak on his uh, book that he published, Climate Change from the Streets, which he'll, he'll say more about. Uh, as you know, at our school, it's one of our key areas, one of our key priorities is thinking about climate justice, climate resilience, and we like to look at it from different perspectives. And Michael, I think, whenever he gives this lecture and the work he's been doing around the world, has really uh, illuminated on some of the things that are happening where we need to go. So I'm happy to have you here. Uh, Dr. Mendez is an assistant professor of urban environmental planning, or in environmental planning and policy at UC Irvine. He's an Andrew Carnegie Fellow and a visiting scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. His most, he most recently served as the inaugural James and Marie Pinoch uh, Faculty Fellow in Sustainability Studies and Associate Research Scientist at the Yale School of the Environment. Dr. Mendez has more than a decade of senior level experience in public and private sectors, where he consulted actively and engaged in the policymaking process. This included working for the California State Legislature as a senior consultant, governmental relations advocate, and a member of the California State Mining and Geology Board, and as vice chair of the Sacramento City Planning Commission. In 2021, California Governor Gavin Newsom appointed Dr. Mendez to the Los Angeles Regional Water Quality Control Board. This board regulates water quality in a region of more than 11 million people. During his time as a scholar, he has contributed to state and national research policy initiatives including serving as an advisor to the California Air Resources Board and as a co-author of the, of the U.S. Global Change Research Program Study on Climate Vulnerability and Social Science Perspectives. Dr. Mendez is a member of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine's Board on Environmental Change in Society and is on the Board of Directors of the Social Justice Nonprofit Alliance for a Better Community. He also serves as a co-author for the forthcoming National Academies of Sciences consensus, consensus study accelerating de decarbonization in the United States, technology policy and societal dimensions, and co-author of the upcoming National Climate Assessment, the US government's premier report on climate change impacts, risk, and adaptation across the nation. Dr. Mendez is a panel reviewer for the National Academies of Sciences Transit Cooperative Research Program, uh, his book has won a number of awards, including the Harold and Margaret Sprout Award, the Betty and Alfred McClung Lee Book Award, and many other honors. Dr. Mendez's new research focuses on climate-induced disasters and social vulnerability. This research has been supported by a National Science Foundation Early Career Faculty Award. In conjunction with the National Center for Atmospheric Research, this project explores the disparate impacts of extreme wildfire events on undocumented Latino, Latina, and indigenous migrants. In 2021, he became the first Latinx scholar to receive the National Academies of Sciences Henry and Bryna David uh, Endowment Award for his wildfire and migrant research. This research was also wildly, wildly uh, covered by many uh, mainstream media outlets. And uh, so Michael will probably talk more about that. In 2022, Dr. Mendez was bestowed with the prestigious uh, Andrew Carnegie Fellowship, which provides research funding to exceptional scholars, journalists, and public inte intellectuals with the capacity of communicating findings to a broad audience. In addition, he was awarded the 23, or 20, 2023 William R. and June Dale Scholar Prize. The Dale Prize honors scholars and practitioners for excellence in urban planning and environmental justice work and research. He received his PhD from UC Berkeley's Department of City and Regional Planning. Uh, where he's a Ford Foundation Fellow and the Chance UC Chancellor's Fellow. He also is a graduate of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he received the Department of Urban Studies and Planning's Award for Best Master's Thesis and Excellence in Public Service Award. He has so many other awards, I won't embarrass you all, but Dr. Mendez, it is a pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure to have followed your career, and we're very delighted that you can join us this evening here at UVA. Welcome. I could go on and on. Yeah, yeah. Thank, doing, thank you so much. So. Uh, it's such a pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, Dean Hudson um, and uh, UVA, so lucky to have you. You were a, a great shining beacon of light in California and New York City, uh, and uh, also nationally and globally in your amazing work. 
So uh, it's an honor to be here to really uh, talk to you about these issues of climate change and issues of environmental justice. Uh, and I, my research, while it focuses on California, also has translocal international perspectives. And in this book that I'll be talking about today, I'll, I'll try to dispel some of the myths or uh, misconceptions or stereotypes you may have of California of being, you know, uh, surfers, hippies, and that environmental policy just happens in that state. And oil industries and other uh, major uh, special interest groups just roll over and play dead whenever the legislature uh, uh, adopts legislation. But instead, I uh, really focus on the internal fights within California. We, we think about climate change often from the perspective of climate deniers. And there's only this binary, you either believe climate change or you don't. But here instead, I'm gonna talk about two groups that actually do believe in climate change and the profound conflicts, the contentious fights, clash of culture and worldviews around how we're going to conceptualize environmental issues, issues around climate change, and more importantly, how we're gonna center racial justice. So you can't have climate change without a racial justice perspective. So again, because of this lecture series on uh, race, diversity, and inclusion, I'm honored to present my book, which really does center people, place, and power in the context of climate change and inequality. And these issues are quite important because in California, we are experiencing a major uh, climate change crisis uh, and a historic racial unrest. In the last several years, millions of people have been impacted by multiple disasters, fires, blackouts, heat waves, drought, hazardous air quality, flooding, and of course, the ever-present COVID-19 pandemic. These are all major life events, and these compounding of disasters have uh, cascading health, social, and economic impacts. And due to uh, existing structural inequalities, these impacts are disproportionately affecting low-income people of color, or what the field of public health calls a syndemic. Uh, to address the climate emergency, many of you may know how activists and policymakers have proposed the Green New Deal at the federal level. Um, this is a radical proposal to decarbonize our economy and address poverty and inequality. However, for the last two decades, uh, low-income communities of color have also pushed state and local governments uh, to experiment with reducing greenhouse gas emissions and approaches that also address inequality and public health. These efforts, as I mentioned earlier, in climate experimentation have been contentious and are often met with significant resistance. While I'm supportive of the Green New Deal, I'm here to say that there's nothing new about the Green New Deal. Climate change experiments in places like California since 2003 have been all out street fights. Environmental justice activists are often pitted against traditional environmentalists who favor the least costly mitigation solutions, which do not necessarily uh, maximize equity and public health outcomes in low income communities of color. These conflicts over climate change are cultural at their core. They illustrate that although the, the science of climate change is clear, policy decisions uh, about how to respond to these effects may remain contentious. Even when such decisions are claimed to be guided by objective knowledge, they are made and implemented through political institutions and relationships and all the competing interests, power, and racial struggles that this implies. So if we look towards the example of California, it reveals the contingent nature of climate change policy, the assumptions, uh, social, political, and cultural attitudes that often create conflict between community understandings of local environmental conditions and the prevailing global top-down conceptualization of climate change. In California, these tensions between different approaches to addressing climate change are often centered on the politics of scale, economics, class, and race. These differences in worldviews, if unacknowledged, can lead to the breakdown of trust even among groups that are normally working towards the same goal, reducing the harm that climate change could do, do to human societies and our planet. So again, for insight into national level conflicts between groups working on climate change, one should look to the nearly two decade California experiment of incorporating environmental justice and health equity principles into climate change policy. This is important for, because for environmental justice activists in California, the main threat from climate change is the disproportionate harm it caused to their bodies and to the health of their communities. For them, climate change is not just about global greenhouse gas models, rather it's also about the opposing worldviews uh, which uh, policy and science has seen. 
yet in California, it's still often seen as a homogenous entity that uniformly values environmentalism and climate action. This image universalizes the idea of climate change and detaches it from its cultural settings. It also obscures how the localization of environmental policy and science within the state involves pro processes of public conflict and legitimacy. For example, um, in this book that uh, was published by a major university press, it won multiple awards and it describes itself as the definitive book on California's environmental history from the founding of Yosemite, John Muir, to modern day climate change policy. And in this 300 page book, people of color are only mentioned twice and it's really done in passing. So there's this traditional environmental narrative of California that facilitates the erasure of people of color in enacting comprehensive environmental policy and leadership. Therefore, I published my book, Climate Change from the Streets, with the explicit focus on people of color. My book foregrounds people, place, and power in the context of climate change and inequality. This research originated in my public policy work for the California State Legislature during a 15-year period. This provided me valuable insight into how the interactions of governments, businesses, and NGOs shape climate change policy. My research is further influenced by my experience growing up in Latino immigrant communities of Los Angeles that face multiple environmental threats. As a youth in places like Pacoima, Lake Guterres, and Selmar, I, I, I was surrounded by people resisting environmental racism, whether protesting the siding of landfills or demanding or organizing to demand the cleanup of toxic properties. They sought to understand how these situations originated, to develop alternatives, and to imagine new environmental futures. Uh, therefore, this has focused my work on what the conceptualization of environmental justice has meant to activists, policymakers, experts, and scholars alike. Understanding uh, this is important because the idea of environmental justice has been growing in scope beyond its initial application to the inequitable distributions of hazardous waste dumps in poor communities of color. My work analyzes the expansion of environmental justice policy discourse and the ways in which it has challenged definitions of nature and society. When I be, be, uh, began this research project in California, I was really struck uh, with the lack of scholarship on the, on the narratives of environmental justice in the context of climate change. The literature shows a real neglect of the environmental justice group's worldview and influence in climate change policy. The lack of a narrative perspective um, is largely due to the fact that, uh, that since the 1980s, environmental justice studies has really sought to legitimize itself as a, a, a rigorous and serious uh, field of study. The, uh, this first generation of environmental justice scholars in general focused on causality and quantifying environmental inequality through the lens of race and class at a single scale. However, an emerging second generation has extended the field to incorporate a deeper consideration of critical theory and intersectionality, the ways in which gender, class, sexuality, immigration status, and other uh, uh, forms of human identity shape environmental justice struggles at multiple policy and geographic scales. Therefore, I take this uh, critical environmental uh, justice studies lens, uh, and this second uh, generation that I just mentioned is dubbed Critical Environmental Justice Studies and focuses on four important questions that are central to my work. The first question of Critical Environmental Justice Studies asks, how does intersectionality, multiple forms of difference, again, human identity, gender, uh, uh, race, uh, immigration status, influence environmental justice outcomes? The second question asks, to what extent should scholars focus on a single scale or multi-scalar analyses of causes and possible resolutions to environmental justice struggles. Third, to what degree do state power and market systems entrench social inequality? And the fourth question, how can marginalized groups whose participation is indispensable to society shape sustainable and collective futures? Using this critical environmental justice studies lens, uh, the main argument in my book is for society to successfully resolve the phenomenon of climate change, critical attention must be placed on the human dimensions of climate policy making, such as local knowledge, culture, and history, and at multiple scales. Central to this argument is the demonstration that environmental protection and improving public health are uniquely linked, and maintaining that link is key to advancing future climate change policies. The case of California is particularly productive to examine how the human dimensions of climate change 
and policy unfold. As the, fifth, the, the world's fourth largest economy and the only U.S. state to implement a comprehensive program of regulatory and market-based mechanisms to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, California has consistently been at the forefront of broader national and global environmental experimentation. The state's cap and trade system, a central based uh, market based mechanism for ensuring carbon emissions reductions, is the third largest in the world after the European Union and China. The, the, the program has been especially contentious in debates within California. Supporters emphasize its global reach and cost effectiveness and detractors criticize the inequitable effects on specific local communities and demographic groups. California's prominence in climate change policy makes it an ideal place to investigate the dynamics of such disputes and the roots in their differing climate change worldviews. My uh, multi-sided ethnographic policy analysis weaves together three interconnected case studies. The first looks at climate change and public health activism and two heavily impacted communities of color. The first is Richmond, California and Oakland, California. The second looks at conflict over state level carbon trading and use of revenue for investment in local communities most impacted by air pollution. And this takes place at the state capital of California, Sacramento. And the, the third looks at international local implications of the forest conservation projects in the global south, in this case, Chiapas, Mexico and Acre, Brazil that are allowed under California, uh, California's market-based climate law change laws. These cases together reveal the, content, uh, the contested politics at the local, state, and transnational levels on which California makes climate change policy and takes action. Um, and most importantly, I follow activists as they travel between geographies, political and policy scales to enact uh, social change. For example, Richmond, uh, California happens to have the largest oil refinery west of the Mississippi, the Chevron refinery. And activists there understand that uh, to stop the, the multiple forms of pollution that's coming from the Chevron refinery, they, yes, they have to uh, protest at Richmond City Hall, but the, at the same time, they understand that Chevron is a multinational company, operates in multiple uh, uh, countries and uh, different political spheres. So they also, uh, at the same time, they're, they're protesting at City Hall, they're protesting at Sacramento, the state capital, because California itself sees itself as a nation state operating its climate change programs on par with Germany, France, and other major climate change leaders. And they, uh, they, if they want to enact change on, uh, to focus on environmental justice, they have to be protesting and lobbying within the le leg le legislative halls of the state capital. At the same time, these climate activists are also working on a third policy scale internationally. Because again, California wants to link its cap and trade system uh, and create these forest, uh, forest uh, offset programs, which I'll talk about momentarily, and um, indigenous communities in uh, Chiapas, Mexico, and Acre, Brazil. Uh, and it's created this interesting translocal activism where uh, activists, uh, primarily people of color in California, are protesting with indigenous rights leaders in Mexico and Brazil to stop California from expanding its cap and trade system to the global south either for fear of land grabs and uh, dispossession of indigenous uh, people and then of uh, uh, environmental justice activists in California that fear that this uh, form of uh, cap and trade system is going to create more pollution back home in Richmond and Oakland. So again, you see this, uh, this translocal sphere which activists move between policy scales simultaneously. So based on this multi-scale um, study, I have three uh, key goals of this uh, multi-scalar research. The first uh, is to demonstrate that public health and environmental justice perspectives can be central to su successful climate change policy development and implementation. The second uh, goal is to offer an interdisciplinary framework for theorizing the kinds of negotiations between scales and worldviews that are uh, involved in the development of equitable climate change policy. And the final one, provides a set of findings that activists can use to negotiate with governments that legitimizes their perspective about the differential impact of climate change on disadvantaged communities. And this third one is quite important as we see President Biden scale up its Justice 40 initiative and other uh, equity principles into climate change policy, which we could talk a little bit more about in the Q&A. So quick note on my methods as a multi-scalar uh, study, my work draws on two main sources notes from my years observing policymaking in the Sacramento State Capitol, and extensive interviews with climate policymakers and environmental justice stakeholders. 
my par participant observer reflections, content analysis, and semi-structured interviews provide valuable information on the conflicts and collaborations defining California's climate change and environmental justice uh, throughout the state and transnationally as well. So now I'm going to jump into this uh, case study of California's climate policies in the global south. While some of you, of you may not agree with this, uh, the following case studies because you're proponents uh, in, uh, of uh, carbon offsets, as scholars and, and environmentalists, it's important to understand the modes, strategies, and logics that uh, strong social movements like environmental justice uh, groups employ. So I ask for you to have an open uh, uh, mind as you hear this case study and these perspectives. So in this case study, um, here we, uh, uh, from my book, here we're jumping policy scales and geographic scales from the local to the global. Uh, we will see how the conceptualization of environmental justice as an organizing theme has spread horizontally throughout California and how it's now vertically linked to the global south in Mexico and Brazil. For California advocates, uh, there has been a growing need to develop a global consciousness uh, in the environmental justice movement. Activists recognize uh, the importance of connecting local agendas with trends they see uh, nationally and internationally around climate change. In this case study, I examined the continued collaboration, experimentation, and coalition building since 2009 um, that have brought California environmental justice perspectives onto the global stage. This story centers on the ways in which carbon markets can, have, uh, can create international links uh, between local injustices and prop, uh, prompt new forms of translocal activism. A central figure in this story is Mary Rose Taruk, an activist with the Asian Pacific Environmental Network, or APEN for short, one of the leading environmental justice groups in California, which is also based uh, in uh, Richmond, California, which has the Chevron refinery. Interesting, her indigenous last name in Tagalog means to know. According to Mary Rose, the need to engage on a global uh, scale became clear when APEN's Native American allies, who also represent sovereign nations, uh, were participating in the United Nations uh, debates on climate change policy. Native American advocacy groups like the uh, Indigenous Environmental Network developed campaigns that brought US environmental justice groups to the United Nations and other global spaces. In these arenas, California environmental justice groups learned how linking their local campaigns could also help indigenous communities in the global south. These interactions laid a strong foundation for a, a new translocal efforts when California attempted to link its cap and trade system uh, to Chiapas, Mexico, and Acre, Brazil through uh, force offset credits. Carbon offsets allow California's polluting industries to pay someone else anywhere in the world to reduce their emissions. Uh, by engaging in activities such as forest conservation. Forest offsets are also known as reducing emissions uh, from deforestation and degradation, or RED for short. In other words, RED offsets allow pollution at home only if developing countries keep their forests in the ground and do not use their own natural resources. Polluting businesses in the United States are allowed to continue to pollute most often in low-income communities of color like Richmond and Oakland. California traditional environmentalists, such as the Nature Conservancy and the Environmental Defense Fund, EDF, uh, polluting businesses, and some large indigenous groups. These are larger indigenous groups that are formally recognized by their governments and have land title, support such offsets because of cost effectiveness, ecological enhancements to tropical forests, uh, and benefit sharing opportunities for indigenous communities. These groups stress the need to compound, uh, combat uh, tropical deforestation, that is the cutting and burning of trees to convert land to uh, grow crops, extract oil, or raise livestock. It is estimated that such activities account for more than 12% of the Earth's human-caused carbon emissions. Polluting um, industries in particular support forest offsets in the global south because it's a significant che uh, cheaper option uh, for reducing carbon emissions when compared to domestic mechanisms. For California environmental justice groups, however, it seemed that red offsets likely would not address local air pollution. They foresaw increased emissions in disadvantaged neighborhoods. Smaller indigenous rights groups in Acre and Chiapas, again, these are smaller groups. They're not recognized by their, their federal governments back home, and they do not have land title, 
argue that new value, the new value of pristine forest reserves could motivate landowners to evict forest-based ind indigenous communities, and especially in regions like Chiapas, Mexico, where there has been a long uh, uh, history of violent conflict over land rights. To them, red uh, could exasperate local uh, environmental problems and per per perpetuate historic injustices. Thus, in response, a new coalition, a translocal coalition, emerged between South and North social movements. Here again, we see how notions of environmental justice travel and are horizontally and vertically linked. This translocal coalition, moreover, argues for a systems thinking um, or feedback loop approach to climate change policy. For example, they claim uh, U.S. imports of crude oil from the Amazon are driving the destruction of some of the uh, rainforest ecosystems most pristine areas and releasing large amounts of greenhouse gases. According to an Amazon Watch study, American refineries process over 230,000 barrels of Amazon crude oil a day. And California represents a large majority, an average of 171,000 barrels, comprising 74% of all Amazon crude imports to the United States. And they also stress about the system thinking approach about the negative external uh, environmental impacts, both in terms of ecological and public health. For example, in, in, uh, uh, only two years ago, this is uh, Richmond, California, the Chevron refinery spilled over 600 gallons of crude oil into the San Francisco Bay. And the Chevron refinery has many, many years of um, uh, not uh, uh, following through with uh, safety right and environmental regulations and even having uh, fires. For example, in 2012, uh, Richmond uh, oil refinery sent 15,000 people to local uh, emergency ho uh, hospital rooms, including children. There's elementary schools and high schools near this refinery, less than a mile away. For Mary Rose, a hostile incident uh, solidified her determination against RED and towards a systems thinking approach for climate change policy. At a 2010 United Nations meeting in Cancun, Mexico, she was detained and tossed out of the uh, climate negotiations for uh, ho uh, holding the sign of posting carbon markets. She told me, quote, you would think I would be afraid that, of that experience, but actually I was encouraged because to the right of me uh, at the protest was the president of Bolivia, Evo Morales, and to the left of me were leaders of the social movements from the Western Hemisphere, from the MST of Brazil and the Via Campesinas of Mexico. And in front of me were Native American brothers uh, and sisters from the Indigenous Environmental Network who had been campaigning to end red forest offsets. Uh, working together in person and via conference calls during 2011, 2012, California environmental justice group and indigenous groups organized an opposition campaign. Uh, through this process, they were able to overcome concerns of groups from Mexico and Brazil that California environmental justice groups themselves uh, might sell out uh, Native, Amer uh, Native indigenous groups in the global south through carbon market trading and revenue sharing opportunities. After several collaborative negotiations, they eventually forged a common understanding and trust about the spatial implications and global reach of California's carbon market, highlighting the potential harms to those living among the trees and those living next to polluting industries. The debate is so contentious again because California has a, a, the third largest cap and trade system in the world after China and the European Union. The implication here is California is a global climate change leader, and if it, the state adopts red offsets, other local governments will follow. While um, policymakers in California proclaim the benefit of forest offsets at international events, uh, several indigenous uh, groups from the global south protested the lack of consultation during the development of a proposal that could impact their lives uh, and lands. The first major global protest against California's uh, carbon market occurred on September 26, 2012, where over 40 indigenous protesters from the Lancon jungle and members of the international NGOs gathered outside the governor's climate and forest task force meeting in Chiapas, Mexico. The task force founded by the state of California brought together governments and businesses uh, dedicated to implementing red policies globally. They represented 16 local governments of six countries, Mexico, Brazil, Indonesia, the United States, Peru, and Nigeria. Uh, that between them held 20% of the world's uh, forest. Among the most vocal protesters at the task force meeting was Ufima Sanchez, 
a Mayan indigenous leader from the remote jungles of uh, Chiapas, denied a chance to address the meeting. Sanchez seized the microphone during the open plenary and spoke before a packed audience of several hundred participants, which, which he said the following. We have come before you today to denounce the programs and projects that threaten to dispossess us of our territories. Why do the wealthy want to impose their will by force? The jungles are sacred and they exist to serve the people. We don't come to your countries and tell you what to do with your lands and your lives. We ask for the same respect. Ufima's rejection of offsets uh, invoked the nature of the forest as a, as a home, a historically contested territory and as a sacred space. Her intervention highlights how climate policy maps onto existing cultural meanings and social and historical dynamics, dynamics concerning property and politics. For example, at, at this protest, you can see at the bottom uh, um, right-hand side, um, in Spanish it reads, the government of Chiapas is lying to us. They did not uh, inform us. They did not co uh, consult us. We don't want bread. So under uh, United Nations and other international laws, before you enter into agreements, uh, in, including environmental agreements that may uh, affect indigenous groups and their lands, there has to be free, prior, and informed consent. And so the allegation here is that free, prior, and informed consent did not take place in California, where it was, was, indeed was in violating human rights. Three weeks after the Forest Task Force meeting, an international delegation of, of indigenous leaders from Brazil, Mexico, and Ecuador traveled to Sacramento, the uh, California state capital, to register, register their opposition to, in person at the California Air Resources Board public hearing on October 18, 2012. The delegation was hosted by the Friends of the Earth and several California environmental justice organizations. While digital uh, communication aided the development of a South-North exchange, activists understood the, that physical sites of assembly were still the most effective way to collectively express resistance and challenge a dominant power. California represented the, the locus of power here, as it is the only local jurisdiction in the world considering red offsets. The presence of indigenous uh, leaders alongside California environmental justice groups moreover showcased a narrative of the potential South-North environmental injustice uh, it derived from California's global market-based solutions. In other words, it was a symbolic uh, reminder of the spatial and human scale impacts of carbon markets. When the, uh, and other um, activists from Chiapas, Mexico, and, and Brazil also registered their opposition at the California Air Resources Board. For example, a public health advocate uh, that worked uh, with indigenous groups in the remote jungles of Chiapas presented this brochure um, that the state of Chiapas, Mexico itself is distributed at one of the United Nations climate change uh, policy conferences. And here you, you can see that it details that 172 uh, uh, illegal groups were re relocated in efforts to avoid deforestation. So this public health advocate that works with indigenous groups made the allegation uh, that while um, the state of Chiapas had not yet entered into a sign agreement with the state of California, that Chiapas um, was indeed uh, anticipating a revenue sharing opportunity and was already going ahead and displacing and dispossessing indigenous people from their lands in anticipation of this uh, cap and trade program in, uh, from California. Uh, also, indigenous leaders from Aca de Brazil spoke in opposition. Ninoa, the president of the Federation of Q&Q People, said the following. Indigenous people are feeling the effects of offset programs. They are restricting our way of life and our ability to have access to our traditional hunting, fishing, and gathering sites. For this reason, we are urging you not to accept red offsets in your trading program. And uh, environmental justice group in California also spoke up in opposition. They, they stated, we stand with our international brothers and sisters. We believe red programs are bad for communities internationally that are being decimated from the program and California community, uh, communities that are not receiving the benefit of local pollution reduction. When the board hearing uh, concluded, members of the, the Translocal Coalition continued their lobbying efforts at the state capitol. They met with legislative leaders and presented them with letters signed by more than 30 California-based organizations opposing red offsets. Following the Capitol Lobby Day, the coalition uh, organized a no-red tour throughout Northern California. 
The coalition members sought to educate the public and uh, about the effects of offset programs on people living both in an industrialized and forest regions. The tour led to a larger policy discussion in the state capitol and news media over California's ability to monitor the integrity and efficacy of international offsets in developing countries. For example, the legal, legal scholar Alan Robon uh, noted that any international offset programs implemented in a developing country would depend on the host country or third parties for ver verification. Corruption at any stage, including reporting, verification, and monitoring could undermine offset programs. <laughs> Ramos' comments influenced by the visibility of the Translocal Coalition further raised concerns with capital staffers and uh, legislators. This included whether the state could monitor international offsets in the same manner as domestic ones. The state, unlike the federal government, lacks international authority uh, to enforce provisions or intervene in another country's sovereignty. Several senior capital staff members told me that California should not um, uh, should be cautious developing such linkages, uh, which could induce or exasperate human uh, rights violations in the global south. <laughs> there also has been uh, a lot of controversy or a lot of uh, contention about uh, these offsets uh, under uh, international uh, regulations uh, for a forest offset uh, to be valid. It has to be able to preserve uh, carbon within uh, uh, the tree for at least 100 years, being that, that carbon sink. But uh, researchers and journalists have really noted major challenges. For example, uh, researchers at UC, Ber uh, UC Berkeley really acknowledge that worldwide we're having extreme wildfire events from California to Australia, Greece, uh, Brazil and that uh, carbon offsets essentially are being decimated. And even if the state of uh, California has some type of buffer, um, a cushion zone that is, um, that is being decimated with these extreme wildfire events. Also, uh, there's been a lot of uh, issues with uh, drug cartels and political corruption. Uh, the Los Angeles Times noted in Mexico, some of the protected forest areas have uh, were being taken over not to grow crops, uh, uh, drugs, but over being taken over by drug cartels uh, for the avocado industries. And one ecologist was quoted as saying, the worst case scenario is that they decide I'm making too much noise and they kill me. So he, this ecologist uh, was sort of a whistleblower for this investigative report. And then also it's economic and political uncertainty. We know that the former president of Brazil uh, was a strong climate uh, denier um, and even bl uh, blamed some of the, the fires that were going on in Brazil on uh, actor and environmentalist Le Leonardo DiCaprio. And even that now we have a new president uh, in Brazil, Lulu, um, that there's still uh, doubt that, uh, that the pr it's going to take years to undo some of the damage um, that the former president did. At a red panel I hosted at the Yale School of uh, Forestry, um, the California Air Resources Board member really commented how this issue is very contentious. And regulators are essentially walking this fine line between balancing in-state political pressures and a goal of combating global climate change. And he, he, he told the audience, are we trying to save California or are we trying to save the world? In some sense, the answer may be both. Flor Fl Flores identified international forest offsets as one of the most con controversial issues facing the board. He added that the Translocal Coalition has done a good job in highlighting the alleged negative aspects of uh, offsets, which makes it more difficult to quickly approve such a program. Throughout uh, 2012 and to present day, California environmental justice groups and, uh, uh, and indigenous rights leaders demonstrated how powerful network coalitions could shape environmental narratives of carbon markets. Uh, uh, during the next five years, this Translocal Coalition help stall momentum towards adoption of an international force offset program. Most importantly, its uh, protests created uh, market and political uncertainty. To the, the, today, the issue continues to be contentious and unresolved in Sacramento. This form of translocal activism is consistent with Margaret uh, Keck and uh, Catherine Shishink's uh, research on global, global human rights activism. What the author terms a boomerang pattern uh, can be observed in the ways in which NGOs in the Global South work with similar domestic groups in the Global North. In the case of translocal opposition to RED, indigenous groups in Chiapas and Acre uh, protested their governments, um, state A, to, to, develop, uh, to stop the development of offset programs. 
However, due to relative weakness of civil society in Mexico and Brazil, meant that these groups uh, lack sufficient power to influence their governments and could even be tar uh, become targets of repression themselves, which is, is uh, diagrammed in blockage pattern there. These groups therefore connected to the California uh, organizations for help. The Global North organizations in comparison had greater freedom of action and benefited from stronger civil societies. Uh, information sharing between and collaboration between regions led uh, California environmental justice groups to protest their government state B to try to block this program. Therefore, under this boomerang pattern, California policymakers perhaps not wanting to be viewed as adopting policies that could uh, provoke human rights abuses abroad began to slow down the process of approval of global offsets. Again, this issue has uh, remained contentious and un unresolved in California. Therefore, through their efforts, anti-red activists are challenging the worldviews that are con uh, considered valid within California's decision-making around climate change. The Translocal Coalition pro pro proposed a fundamental question. Who has the, the power to protect nature and humanity uh, from the existential threat of climate change? The answer has emerged in various forms of conflict and collaboration. California's climate change policy increasingly depends on the ways in which it incorporates marginalized voices within the state and around the globe. So some key findings from uh, this translocal coalition is that distant groups formed an anti-red uh, campaign based on diverse worldviews and histories. Environmental justice is interconnected. Environmental justice groups travel across geographies and scales to effectively, effectively address them. And there are spatial implications of these carbon markets. Third, the coalition challenged state power within the North and South, rejecting global structures, structures that embedded environmental injustices within climate change solutions. And instead of only market-based uh, solutions, EJ groups also argued for alternative equitable approaches. However, there's a lot of limitations and challenges uh, on the, of these translocal activism. There's unequal power dynamics between global North and global South activists. There's divergent perspectives and priorities among Global South Indigenous groups, U.S. Native American tribes, and California EJ groups. As I mentioned before, there are Indigenous groups in Mexico and Brazil that are strongly in support of these programs. Again, these are the ones that are recognized by their government, have land title, and smaller groups that are not uh, recognized by their governments and don't have land title are opposed. Uh, third, the state and market uh, forces might co-opt uh, the movement. They can add on some sort of greenwashing and saying they're doing some equity provisions, but not really addressing structural issues. And then red is an unresolved issue. There's difficulty sustaining translocal coalitions over time. It takes a lot of money, a lot of effort to uh, do these type of work. So what does this really mean? What are the sort of the broader theoretical implications of, of, uh, of this research, of this case study? Through my more than 10 uh, years of research, I came to see a tension between different worldviews of climate change, those of scientists, mainstream environmental groups and policymakers, and those of environmental justice activists. Uh, while these worldviews are not absolute, they are the generalization of the dynamics I initially observed in California between 2006 and 2012. In the first worldview, I generally saw one based on utilitarianism, efforts to develop climate change policy for the greatest good, for the greatest number. I call this worldview car carbon reductionism, an adherence to cost effectiveness and market-based solutions focus only on reducing greenhouse gas emissions without social equity or local health considerations for the most polluted communities. Under, under this worldview, my research generally observed governments being judged whether their policies are cost effective and benefit the majority. So under carbon reductionism, there's a strong uh, GHG reduction uh, potential, and it's measured in tons of carbon emission uh, of CO2 equivalent, because carbon is the most abundant uh, GHG in the atmosphere. And there's a strong scientific framing and detached expertise around uh, climate change, its solutions, uh, how, we, how we measure it. Um, and uh, th these solutions are often focused on cost effectiveness. How can we reduce carbon emissions without having a major shock to our economy? And this is often done through market-based uh, solutions such as carbon markets or cap and trade, which again, California is the third largest in the world. And these cap and trade systems are, are seen as being geographically neutral. Since carbon emissions 
uh, are not local pollution. They mix uniformly in the global atmosphere. It doesn't matter where you reduce carbon emissions so long as you reach that global target. So you could do all your carbon emissions in a wealthy community like Beverly Hills, or you can do, one, uh, do them all in a community like uh, Richmond, uh, California. Um, and in the early years, there was just an emphasis also on mitigation, not on adaptation, and not acknowledging that the impacts of climate change, heat waves, drought, and uh, wildfires are happening and disproportionately affecting low-income communities of color. So conversely, on the other side, uh, environmental justice groups generally had a moral rights-based worldview. I dubbed their worldview as climate change from the streets, a critical reevaluation of both the practice and politics of reducing carbon emissions. Their worldview considers social equity and argues that a utilitarianism approach ignores distinctions between uh, people and the disproportionate impacts of climate change on low-income communities of color. My research observed that the environmental justice worldview as participatory, embodied, and experimental. So on the right-hand side, climate change from the streets has this strong uh, co-benefits for potential. Yes, it's concerned of how to reduce carbon emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, but also understand that climate change is happening within larger society. And the, the chief cause of climate change is the burning of fossil fuels. So the burning of fossil fuels not only creates carbon emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, but all that are global in nature, but also local pollution that stays at the local level, NOx, SOx, particulate matter, some of the precursors of the smog that stays at the neighborhood scale and affects people's health. Under traditional climate change policy, you bifurcate global pollution from local pollution. So here they, they ask for co-benefits uh, uh, approach, uh, uh, marrying together co-pollutants, public health outcomes, and GHG mitigation. So there's a strong contextual framing uh, of climate change. Again, understanding that there's multiple systems affected, multiple people. And uh, it, it has a strong local expertise, understanding that people that are at the front lines of uh, polluting industries at the, those, uh, that are ha first and hardest hit should be part of the solutions as well. So there's an emphasis, yes, on cost effectiveness, but not at the expense of social equity. Uh, and uh, uh, social equity is really rooted in community-based solutions. These people next to the polluting industries should be able to enact some neighborhood scale projects that's multi-scalar, that addresses mitigation, and also adaptation. Environmental justice groups in 2012 were the first, even before groups like Sierra Club and EDF, to really advocate for adaptation at that neighborhood scale, again, because these communities were being hardest hit. Many of you may consider uh, these two worldviews a simple dichotomy. However, its use is intended to highlight a critical analysis of the contentious politics of scale, economics, class, and race, and it helps us as scholars and experts understand that actors involved in climate change policymaking are often speaking uh, from structural locations that are worlds apart. In yet in 2012, I witnessed a big change in climate policymaking. It became more participatory and synergetic. Through a re reoccurring process of conflict and collaboration, a broad range of individuals and organizations are now co-producing what climate change means. Geographer Mike Hume uh, often argues that this tension between worldviews can have a balancing, even creative impact, yielding stronger, more robust approaches to resolving climate change. Furthermore, worldviews are not fixed and they can transform over time. Scientific ideas and beliefs about climate change evolve together with the representations, identities, debates, and institutions that give practical effect and meanings to public policies. In other words, the ways in which we conceptualize climate change doesn't just happen. People are behind our government policies and environmental values, and they can change their minds. For example, uh, in 2017 at a United Nations uh, climate conference, the former California governor Arnold Schwarzenegger made the statement that environmentalists were really ascribing to the wrong uh, worldview around climate change. And they didn't really focus on a people-centered approach and how people were dying of cancer and dying from this pollution. And, uh, and this is really telling because uh, when he was governor and pushed forward uh, uh, some of these climate change uh, uh, efforts, he really fought against centering environmental justice, a racial justice lens, and most importantly, public health. So a couple of years later to see him move away from this really shows the, uh, the, uh, how his changing perspective reflects the broader evolution of California's worldviews on climate change. 
through such instances, we can assess the diversification of climate change and politics, tracing how scientific facts about the world are, are often fused with social commitments. And to wrap up, uh, to wrap this up, I attribute this uh, co-productionist framework as being underscored by the narratives of embodiment. Environmental justice groups were pushing new hypotheses as well as evaluating existing ones around climate problems and solutions. They were calling for multiple ways of learning and knowing about climate change. Through my many years of uh, research and interviews, I observed how environmental justice groups centered their work on telling stories of how their bodies bear the marks of environmental interactions. They frame their work on the human embodiment of climate change and carbon's associated co-pollutants. For them, the bodies were diverse points of pollution, social stratification, and poverty intersect. I call this way of knowing and learning climate embodiment, a concept that draws on ecofeminist studies in the field of public health. For example, environmental justice advocates in Richmond, California, argues for a holistic understanding of, links, of the links between the infrastructural body that is the extraction of raw materials or the refining of crude oil to the construction of buildings to the contaminated human body. In other words, we begin to imagine a form of climate embodiment that represents a continuum where the human body that cannot be uh, separated from its environment and environmental solutions cannot be isolated from the human body. So in conclusion, this embodied research represents new models of engagement with climate change uh, that makes space for alternative paradigms of environmental protection. My engagement with key stakeholders since 2003 has allowed me to critically analyze how the success of climate change policy in California now depends on incorporating marginalized voices and embodied perspectives from the local and global scales. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions.